Hello, beautiful people. Hope you're having an excellent day. Uh, we're already into February. It's hard to believe. We've already finished the first six months at Metron, and I've loved every minute of it. Uh, this month, our Artist of the Month is both my son Jonah and my son Judah. They're alternating weeks because of their schedules. Uh, we had Jonah last Sunday. We'll have Judah this Sunday. Jonah will be back the following Sunday, and then Judah will be back on the 22nd. I always love when uh, my kids are there in the service with me. Uh, our outreach of this month is made, and um, Emmanuel will be there to talk about that. Also, Miss Jewel's bringing the kids to do a sign language thing for um, it's a Black History Month tribute. At the end of the service, this isn't our our uh, Metron event for the month, but we're going to see the movie Selma for anybody that wants to go. Our actual event will be on Saturday the 21st. We're going to the King Center to his birthplace, all of that area over there. We're going to take the streetcar, the new Atlanta streetcar, over to Centennial Park and visit the Human and Civil Rights Museum. So I'm very excited about that. And uh, just every week at Metron has just been a, a, a delight. I enjoy it. I, I appreciate that we're still in touch with so many of you who are part of the cyber congregation and uh, love you guys, and especially those of you who support. We really, really appreciate it. Uh, the other day I was reading, um, a quote by Deepak Chopra that I really like a lot. It resonates with me. He says, uh, everyone is doing the best. Every person is doing the best that he or she can according to their level of awareness, something like that. I might not have quoted it exactly right, but what he was saying is similar to what Paul said, uh, to the Romans. He said, if it be possible, as much as lies in you live peaceably with all people. The emphasis being, it may not be possible to get along with everybody. Um, as far back as the book of Amos in chapter three, verse three, he says, how can two walk together lest they be agreed? Jesus certainly was all about the love piece, but he also said things like, don't cast your pearls before swine. And uh, he told his disciples, he said, go into a city and if they receive you, give them everything you've got. If not, shake the dust off your feet and move on to a more agreeable audience. Um, even over there in Matthew chapter 18, where he said, if you've got an odd against someone, go confront them about it. And if they receive you, or if they don't receive you, take a witness. If they don't receive that, then bring them before the church. If they don't receive that, then just move on. So Jesus did not ascribe to this idea that you just keep trying to make the people who don't accept you, accept you. Um, I've learned this, especially in the last really going on five years now. It's it's nearly half a decade since I came out publicly. But even before that, I know a few years back when I started really preaching what I believe was the whole counsel of God about the finished work on the cross and um, what Jesus actually did. I don't call that universalism, but I think people who don't sort of have a pedestrian understanding of theology think that's universalism. It's not, but... Um, I've been called just about everything, so labels don't really upset me. But I do know that there were a lot of people at Church in the Now at the time who um, loved me and believed I was anointed and believed I was their pastor, but they just could not challenge their theological comfort zone. and um, No hard feelings, they just couldn't go with me uh, in that direction. And um, that's not exclusive to me. I mean, Jesus was constantly having sort of these... Um, epiphany moments with people where they just they just could not move in the direction that he was moving. And, and he didn't really spend a lot of time trying to fix that. Even uh, over there in John chapter 6, where he, he does this very controversial teaching about uh, where he says, unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you have no part of me. And it scandalized most of his followers. They It was a deal breaker for them. And Jesus didn't try to do any damage control. He didn't throw a press conference and try to explain what he was talking about. He just turned to the ones who remained and he said, well, are you going to go too?" implying that as important as people were to him, uh, the, the search for truth and the bringing truth into the earth was paramount to him. Um, I know um, when I came out, there were lots of people who said, you know, I love you and you've been my pastor for 25 plus years, but I there's four verses of scripture Really, nothing Jesus said, but there's two things that Moses said and two things that Paul said that I, I can't get my head around. And so, um, you know, they broke fellowship with me. And, you know, it is what it is. I don't, 
really lose a lot of sleep over that because I know history is on the side of people who are progressive and tell the truth. And that um, motto for Church in the Now that I, that I said years ago, real people experiencing the real God in the real world, I mean, I mean that now more than ever. So, you know, there was a little bit of a transition. Then when I decided that I was at the end of my season in Conyers and Covington, there were lots of people who said, wow, we love you, but we can't perceive you outside of this church um, setting. And, um, you know, they just couldn't progress with me. What's interesting to me is many of the people who were the most supportive of Church in the Now were the first ones to understand what I was doing with Metron and move with me. But I know not everybody's at that level as Chopra says people are doing the best they can at their level of consciousness. And a lot of people are very married to that idea of a church and a church building and a children's ministry and a praise team and all that sort of thing. And there's nothing wrong with that. I'm just moving sort of in a different direction. No, no problem. It just is what it is. And, um, and then even recently, you know, Ken and I were married on uh, December 31st in New York and it's not legal here in Georgia yet because apparently Georgia is just going to prove its point and be the last one to come in. But it's it's uh, legal federally, and we are married. We're not trying to make any kind of gay point. We're not gay activists. We're just two men that are very grateful that we found each other at this stage in our lives. And we're both monogamous, and we're both commitment-oriented and believe in marriage. And so we got married. And uh, again, there were people who were okay with me telling everybody what I had always known about myself. It's not some new revelation. I, I knew, I didn't know what to call it, but I knew I was gay when I was four or five. Um, but there were people who just said, wow, we, you know, we can't transition with you to marriage. Marriage is supposed to be between a man and a woman. And I, you know, I take issue with that. When people say, um, we need to support biblical marriage. I think, well, have you read the Bible? Because, most of the marriages in the Bible were men with harems. Um, Solomon had 700 wives and 300 concubines. So I, I don't think you want biblical marriage. I think you might be thinking about um, conventional marriage. And my issue with that is when people say um, uh, marriage should be only between a man and a woman because it's for procreation. Well, again, that's not necessarily true. Most of the people that I've married in the last few years uh, have been on their second, some third marriages. I've married older people. I've married elderly people who have already had their children. They're not planning on having children. Furthermore, if you were really going to extend that idea that it's only between a man and a woman for procreation, then you'd have to do a fertility test on every uh, engaged couple to make sure they could procreate. And if you're really going to follow that logic, then you'd have to say that really the only uh, reason for sex is for procreation. And if you believe that, then you, you better not practice birth control. Um, you know, people really need to think about their argument. I was listening, I won't say his name, but there's a, a potential uh, can candidate for president for next year. And he's already made a statement that if his party embraces marriage equality, he's going to, um, you know, disconnect from the party. And his his point is, is look, I didn't make up this rule. This is what God said because he, you know, I guess he thinks Paul and Moses were God. But um, he says I can't, I can't evolve away from the from what the Bible says. You know, biblical marriage means a man and a woman. And again, I I think, wow, really, you're really going to go for biblical marriage because it, according to the Bible, if that's your if that's your point of reference, then. You need to bring every woman out before the church, before the elders of the city and do a virginity test on her like Moses uh, initiated. It was a very humiliating thing. Men never had to go through a virginity test, but women did. And um, I don't think anybody, no matter how much they say they love the Bible, wants to, wants to have a virginity test done, especially not in front of the elders. Um, According to the Bible, if, uh, you know, if a man got tired of his wife, all he had to do was um, just send her a writ of divorcement. And she was out, and, and he got to absorb all of her dowry that she brought into the marriage. He was under no obligation to provide for her. Uh, even you look back with Hagar and Abraham, you know, when she went out into the wilderness, that was it. You know, she, she didn't take anything with her but Ishmael. So all of this stuff that I hear about what the Bible says, especially who believe people who believe the, the Bible is the definitive word of God, I think, you know, if you're going to make that strong an issue for marriage, you really need to read what the Bible says. And furthermore, 
If, if you are a heterosexual married couple, according to what the Bible says, when uh, husbands, when your wife's on her menstrual cycle, you need to send her out of the house. She's not supposed to even be in the house with you, even to be sent out of the camp. And after her uh, days of instru- menstruation are over, you're supposed to uh, cleanse everything in the house. Anything that she touched was considered uh, unclean. So, um, you know, people that think they believe the Bible, believe every word of it. My question is, as well, if you really believe it that strongly, then you need to practice all of it. And I don't, I don't know many straight couples that want to do that. I don't know many women that want to sleep in the garage while they're on their period. Um, so you say you believe the Bible, but you don't really practice it. You, you, most people that are fundamentalists pick and choose, you know, whatever uh, verses are going to buttress their um, certain prejudice and enforce it on someone else. Um, but I know that not everybody is walking in that kind of awareness. I, I don't get a lot of hate mail anymore, but I got one the other day from some guy, I think he was in the Netherlands, and he just now found my coming up video online, and he was real upset about it. He was really mad and just saying the you know same things that people have said to me thousands of times in letters. And I, you know, he was on Facebook, and I looked at him, and I unfriended him, and deleted him, and put the next people in that were on deck, because I stay at my friend limit all the time. And um, but I was thinking, wow, this guy's really angry about somebody that he doesn't even know. And he was telling me that I was rewriting the Bible. And it, how am I going to argue with somebody like that? They have a they have a certain mindset, and that's just the way they see things. So I have to say, well, everyone is doing the best they can at their level of consciousness. And I, not everybody could go with me on my revelation, but I can't make any apology for what I believe is what, what God has shown me. I'm very careful about how I say God said this, God said that. But that voice that I've heard in me my entire life says certain things to me that resonate with certain people who, wow, those people at Metron have stayed with me through all kinds of transition, and they they still hear my voice every week. So, you know, these are mature, intelligent people that uh, know the Bible. They're they're not novices. I'm not deceiving anybody. These people have discernment. Um, But I also know that people are very married to their religious ideas, so I don't lose a lot of sleep over it. I just say, well, we're all doing the best we can at our level of consciousness. Um. I was talking to somebody a few minutes ago and I, and I said, you know, if I, if I had to just do away with the entire Bible and leave one phrase that would be the definitive phrase, it would be, let there be light. That was what the whole thing started with and that's what we're still trying to do. So those of you that have been supportive of me and of Ken and me, we thank you so much and understand that uh, we believe in marriage. We believe in the family. We're, we're good fathers. I'm a good grandfather. He's about to be a grandfather. Uh, we're good men that love each other very much and aren't ashamed at all. Not only are we not ashamed of it, we believe God brought us together. If you don't believe that, then that's something you have to work out. You've come too late to convince us otherwise. But I do believe in that concept of continuing to put the light out there, and that's why I show up every Sunday at Metron, and amazingly, there's a whole bunch of people that show up there, too, to hear what I have to say, what I believe that what I've received by divine impartation, enlightenment, revelation, whatever you're going to call it. And this Sunday will be no exception. I'll be there at 11 o'clock. I hope uh, many of you will be there as well. Hope you have an awesome day.